Hi everyone, this is Hypercubist. Well, I uploaded my very first math explainer two weeks ago, and boy was I amazed at the response it got. It's still a bit surreal. All praise the almighty algorithm. Thanks to everyone who has subscribed, I am excited to get this channel off the ground and share cool math ideas with a wide audience. I'm well into making my next video, it will be up soon, but I wanted to first put out this short follow-up to the derivative video. Though I've gotten a ton of positive responses from people who appreciated the elegance of the form, I also had a lot of comments pointing out objections, some of which are valid and some that, well, completely missed the point. I feel like a lot of folks seem to be missing the big picture of what I was trying to show, so I wanted to address some common objections as well as highlight the key takeaways that I didn't fully go over in the first one. If you haven't seen the first video, definitely check that out on my channel first. Is this multiplicative definition new? Well, it is the limiting case of the Q derivative, which is over 100 years old, so in that sense, no. But it was new to me when I found it for myself, and it seems to be new to the majority of you. The number of times I've come up with something new before learning that it's already a thing, well, you get it. Simpsons did it. Is it different from the standard form? That depends on how you look at it. It does the exact same thing. It turns a secant line into a tangent line. And at least for non-zero x, gives the exact same result. It has to, otherwise it wouldn't be the derivative. The difference is how you get there. For a fixed value of t, the multiplicative form responds differently to x before you take the limit. It keeps the run in the rise over run proportional to x, as opposed to a fixed distance for a given value of h in the old form. And this has very interesting consequences for two important types of functions. For power functions, the rise is always proportional to x to the n, and the run is proportional to x. So if the slope is rise over run, it is immediately obvious that the slope is proportional to x to the n minus 1. We showed that this was true even after you take the limit. So the derivative is proportional to x to the n minus 1, with the proportionality constant being f prime of 1. That's true for any real non-zero power, not just positive integers. From a teaching point of view, that's the kind of thing a student would feel at a gut level with almost no math to get in the way. You don't get that kind of insight from the standard form. Also, the power rule can be proved for negative and rational powers with simple substitutions and factoring, as I did in the first video, something that's trickier to do with the standard form. As an exercise, try proving power rule for x to the negative n, x to the m over n, x to the negative m over n, using the multiplicative form and the tools that I used, and then see if you can do it with the standard form. And see for yourself what you think is easier. And for logs, we can also see why the derivative has the form that it does. Again, the slope is rise over run, and the run is proportional to x. But in this case, the rise is constant. We can see that mathematically as ln of tx minus ln of x cancels out. But going deeper, we can look at x as an exponential function of y. So x equals e to the y. For a fixed vertical distance, the horizontal distance has to be proportional to x. So the slope of the secant line for fixed t must be proportional to 1 over x, which holds as we take the limit. And again, the proportionality constant has to be f prime of 1. So if you've ever wondered why the derivative of a natural log function, or any log function for that matter, has the form that it does, now you know. But interestingly, through this lens, it's not the x in the denominator that makes it special. That's just the run, just like in the power function case. It's the 1 in the numerator that makes it unique. OK, now let's talk about the elephant in the denominator. Yes, this definition fails at x equals 0. My proposed fix for this was just to define f prime of 0 as the limit as x approaches 0 of f prime of x. And this works fine for functions that are continuously differentiable, meaning the derivative at any point is equal to the limit of the derivative as x approaches that point. For the functions we've been discussing, there's absolutely no problem. But as a few people pointed out, there are functions, like this bad boy over here, x squared sine of 1 over x, 
whose derivative at zero exists using the standard definition, but the limit as x approaches zero of the derivative does not. So yes, that was an oversight on my part. But that brings us to the big picture. I am certainly not advocating we replace the definition of the derivative as some people seem to think. In addition to the zero issue, it doesn't generalize well to higher dimensions. And as I mentioned, it isn't even all that useful outside of some basic types of functions. So why bother learning it? It's just a change in perspective that offers elegant solutions and deeper insight into certain kinds of functions. It's another tool in the toolkit, that's all. Could you teach this to a Calc 1 class with the appropriate caveats after they've learned the standard form? They certainly have the tools to understand it, and with some nudging on the details, they'd likely appreciate the cleaner algebra. I personally feel that the insight you gain into power rule alone is worth exposing them to it. But I'm a professional tutor, not a classroom teacher, and don't have to worry about confusing the class with yet another formula. So I get it. It's certainly debatable. Maybe it's just useful or interesting to people who watch videos like this and enjoy revisiting math to gain deeper understanding. Because that's all that video was about, gaining insight into a fundamental concept by using a different, well, approach. Now, here's a challenge question that will lead into the next video. How do you prove to someone who has not had calculus why the area under the parabola y equals x squared is one third of x cubed. You can assume they have all the standard algebraic and geometric tools up to pre-calc, but no derivatives, integrals, or limits of any kind. Think on that, and I'll see you next time.